Okay, so, nasty illness, nasty treatment. I'm trying hard to stay alive. Uh, so I take exercise five or six days a week. And, thank you, Steve. I'm very fortunate insofar as my route takes me <laughs> along a particular street in Tel Aviv, Lohame Gallipoli, the Gallipoli Fighter Street. Nearby are other streets named for Patterson, whom we'll come to shortly, for Lieutenant Commander Josiah Wedgwood, who was with the machine guns on the bows of the River Clyde, and there are streets named for Brigadier General Monash and for Margolin. Monash and Margolin were both at Anzac. Uh, Margolin was a company commander and a major at, uh, at this point in 1915. <coughs> so, Gallipolians are by no means forgotten in Tel Aviv. Highlighted in the Hebrew language version, you will see the name of Captain Joseph Trumpledore. Trumpledore was born in Piatigorsk in 1880. That's in the Caucasus. He was born into a secular Jewish family. He studied <coughs> dentistry before being conscripted into the Tsarist army in 1902. The next year, he was transferred by the army to Port Arthur in Manchuria, where they were facing the Japanese. And on the 7th of August 1904, during a particularly heavy bombardment, Trumpledore was badly wounded by shrapnel and lost his left arm. He spent three months in hospital. However, after this, he requested to be allowed to rejoin his unit. And he was still serving with the Russians at their surrender to the Japanese when nearly 80,000 of them became prisoners of war. December 1905, the POWs returned from Japan to Russia via Manchuria and Siberia. Eventually he reaches St. Petersburg, he's decorated by the Tsar for bravery and receives a commission in the reserves. It's understood that at that time he was probably the only Jewish officer in the Russian army. Without his left arm, nobody wants left a single-handed dentist, do they? <laughs> Without his left arm, he took to the study of law in St. Petersburg. And he was there still in 1912, when with a number of like-minded Zionist friends, he left Russia for Palestine. In 1914, he was working on the communal farming settlement at Degania, which is the southwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. <coughs> now then, all these Russian immigrants in Palestine. The total population of Palestine in 1914 was about 84,000. There had been a great influx of Russians due to the anti-Semitism, the pogroms, which were in many cases, <coughs> murderous. What was their situation at the outbreak of war? Well, they became enemy aliens. One solution was to accept Ottoman citizenship, and many did. However, about 12,000 refused, and as enemy aliens, they were expelled to Egypt. Deportations began in December 1914, and they continued through the spring. Many traveled on neutral Italian ships, but some were lucky enough to travel courtesy of the United States Navy. And in the top picture, you see them disembarking from the cruiser, the USS Tennessee. <coughs> so amongst the refugees is Joseph Trumpledore, and he makes a point of calling on the consul of the Russian Empire in Alexandria. He's going to pick up his pension, which he hasn't touched since he left in 1912, so to a refugee he has a tidy sum coming his way. 
And through Consul Petrov, he meets the journalist Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky. This is a photograph of the refugees outside Gabari camp. And you see at this point, gentleman in a felt hat, that is the newspaper correspondent Zev Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky is the same age as Trumpledore, but he was born in Odessa. He studied law in Switzerland and Italy and was an accomplished writer whose work were, was commented upon by Gorky and Tolstoy. After the Kishinev pogrom in 1903, he becomes a committed Zionist. He abandons the law and turns to journalism. In 1908, his newspaper sent him to Istanbul, where he is covering the events of the Young Turk Revolution. He stays in Istanbul for some time and gets to know the Ottoman Empire's situation fairly well. When the Ottoman Empire enters the war, Jabotinsky foresees that no matter who the victor is, the Ottoman Empire will not survive. And this, he thinks, is Zionism's opportunity. So, Jabotinsky has the idea, and he puts it to Trumpledore, and he agrees, a good idea, to raise volunteers to free the homeland, to free Eretz Israel. And so, the pair of them go before an assembly of uh, the community leaders in Alexandria and put this idea to them. That's on the 2nd of March. They get the OK, and a week later, on the 9th, they're putting their proposal to an assembly of the refugees. At that point, they get between 100 and 200 pledges to join up. At this point, Trumpledore dips into his pension pot and takes out three Egyptian pounds. He gives them to Zev Chabotinsky for the fund for the battalion of volunteers. Chabotinsky makes out uh, a receipt for those three Egyptian pounds <laughs> on the back of one of his business cards, <laughs> dates it with the Hebrew date, and signs it in Hebrew. Those three Egyptian pounds of 1915 Today, they'd have a purchasing power equivalent to about 300, 310 pounds sterling. So he made a, a decent contribution. <clears throat> right, they have some signatures, they have some interest, they have the backing of the community. Their next step is to put the proposal to the British authorities. And as far as the army is concerned, in <coughs> Egypt, that is represented by the GOC Egypt, Maxwell. He had to explain to them that the Army Acts restricted his recruitment of alien soldiers. He had further to dent their enthusiasm by explaining that he had no plan to invade Ottoman Palestine. However, he had at the back of his mind a request that Birdwood had put in Remember, Hamilton has yet to arrive. Birdwood was still in command at this point. Birdwood had requested mule transport. And so Maxwell puts it to them, come with us, be mule drivers in a transport and supply capacity against the Turks, but on another front. Jabotinsky felt insulted by the idea of driving mules. He uh, took the huff, left Egypt almost immediately. In contrast, Trumpledore, with his previous military experience to draw upon, knew full well the value of transport and supplies on the battlefield, and he decides to press ahead with their idea. Another meeting takes place, and it takes place on the 19th of March. Now, that's a fairly significant date. That's the day after the Navy had their upset in the Straits. 
everybody, I imagine, everybody was very busy. Maxwell certainly was. He couldn't attend this meeting. He sent a member of his staff. There was also uh, Mr. Hornblower from the Ministry of the Interior. He was the Inspector of Refugees. Some writers have speculated that Godley was there. I imagine that Godley would be very busy like Maxwell. Birdwood was away in Mudros meeting de Robeck and the newly arrived commander in chief, Hamilton. So I think that in Egypt, Godley would have enough on his plate without attending this meeting. And in his memoirs, there's absolutely no mention of it whatsoever. Somebody allegedly spoke very eloquently, addressing the Jewish people in friendship, mentioning a Jewish Palestine, and offering the outstretched hand. It seems to me that the language probably was not so extravagant, and the speaker was almost certainly Captain GWV Holditch DSO, who was there representing Maxwell. He was one of his staff. And when judging this language, consideration must be given to the problems of translation. English was spoken, but it had to be translated into Russian, Yiddish, and Hebrew, and very possibly also into Ladino and Arabic. And as happens in these situations, there's a certain amount of embroidery as it goes along <laughs> from language to language. <clears throat> the points which got through, however, were friendship and Palestine. The enthusiasm raised was very great. However, there can be no doubt that a portion of the refugees assembled there believed that they were not going to fight Turkey in Turkey, but they were going to fight them on what they thought of as their own homeland. A few days later, on the 23rd of March, the Grand Rabbi of Alexandria, Raphael de la Pergola, he administers the oath to the volunteers, and Maxwell appoints as commander of this new unit one Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson, DSO. So who was Patterson? What was he doing in Egypt? Well, he was born in 1867 and brought up a Protestant. He was born in Ireland. 1885, he joined the army, possibly a year under age. He served with the army in India. By 1892, he had risen to become a sergeant and was seconded to the Indian Military Works Department as a supervisor of civil engineering projects. In 1898, the Indian Army sent him to British East Africa to take charge of 3,000 Indian and African laborers who are building a railway bridge across the Tsavo River. Patterson in charge of this huge labor force as a huge problem. Every night, the laborers' camp is attacked by man-eating lions. There's quite a toll. 28 Indians are killed and probably more than 100 Africans. Skillful tracking and shooting by Patterson put a stop to the problem. A few years later, he will publish a book on this, The Man-Eaters of Tsavo. This will bring him some handsome royalties and worldwide fame. Back in London, Patterson <coughs> receives a commission in the Imperial Yeomanry, and in 1900, he goes to South Africa with the Rough Riders. As the saying goes, he has a good war. He's mentioned in dispatches by both Roberts and Kitchener. <coughs> he gets promotion and is awarded the DSO. Soon after, he's promoted again, becoming a major and then an honorary lieutenant colonel. Back in London, he enjoys the company of high society. 
His club was right next door where we were yesterday, the Cavalry Club. And there he's known to his friends as Colonel Pat. After his book is published, President Roosevelt seeks his advice on big game hunting and has him as a guest at the White House. He also sends him up to Alaska to see US Army maneuvers. And indeed, over the course of the years before the First World War, Patterson gets to see maneuvers in most of the major countries in Europe, including Germany. So, 1907. Steve, thank you. 1907, he seconded from the army to the colonial office and is appointed there their chief game warden in the British East Africa Protectorate, what we now call Kenya. 1908, 1909, there is something of a scandal. And my friend, the Grand Inquisitor there, has put his blue pencil through this. If you see me in the bar afterwards, we may be able to expand a little bit. <laughs> Suffice it to say, at this moment, the Colonial Secretary Lord Crewe holds an investigation. He exonerates Patterson. However, as often happens in situations like this, he follows it up by announcing that Patterson has had to resign on health grounds. <laughs> 1913. The Home Rule Bill is struggling through Parliament. Nevertheless, the Protestant population of Ireland are organising. They have the wind up. They get, eventually, an organisation of probably 100,000. And they give command of their West Belfast Battalion to none other than Lieutenant Colonel John <coughs> Henry Patterson. Our first speaker was kind enough to mention how the Germans were interfering all over the place, selling arms hither and thither. There is a strong suspicion, and it is widely believed in Ireland, that Patterson was involved in the spring of 1914 in the landing of arms at Larn. We're talking here about 25,000 rifles and between three and five million rounds of ammunition, all bought in Germany. So, was it any surprise? August 1915, war breaks out. Colonel Patterson hightails it to London, starts knocking on doors at the war office. Alas, no employment is found for Colonel Pat. At this point, 1915, he gives up knocking on doors in Whitehall, pays his own way to Egypt, and thinks that there he would probably run into some people he met in the Boer War. They will remember him, and he might get a job. Maxwell was uh, governor of Pretoria for a time, and Godley was certainly there. The ZMC is taking shape. We were at the swearing-in on the 23rd with the chief rabbi. So at that stage, we have five British officers, five Jewish officers, and 366 other ranks. Not enough. Recruiting continues. The five British officers were Guy, Carter, McLaren, and the brothers Rollo, Ibram, and Claude. My apologies all round. You see here in the centre Colonel Patterson. We have four out of the five, and I regret I cannot identify who is who. There's a guess that the gentleman on, uh, on the left, standing close together, may be the brothers Rollo, but that's only a guess. So Patterson is planning an establishment of 500 men and 700 mules, four troops, 120 each, commanded by one British and two refugee officers. Things coming together, 5th of April, 
Maxwell thinks he can report to Hamilton on the progress, and he writes thusly, the Zai Mule Corps, composed of about 375 Jewish refugees from Palestine, mostly Russian veterans of the Russo-Japanese War, with 650 good pack mules, has been formed to assist in solving the difficulty of transport in the roadless theater of operations. They can be equipped with Mausers as soon as you wish. At present located in Alexandria under Lieutenant Colonel Patterson, late Essex Yeomanry. Those Mausers came from the Turks who had attacked the Suez Canal two months earlier. And as we'll see later on, they may have complicated the matter somewhat. Maxwell was certainly right in saying that the refugees were from Palestine and the majority were of those refugees were Russians. However, it's most unlikely that they were veterans, all veterans of the Russo-Japanese War. So, 14th of April, the Zion Mule Corps passes from Maxwell's command to that of General Hamilton, CNC Mediterranean Expeditionary Force. And Hamilton has already been in Egypt inspecting the forces, the elements of his force assembling there. And he passes by the ZMC's camp at Wadian and records in his diary. The mules look very fit. So do the Assyrians. And although I did not notice that their cohorts were gleaming with purple or gold, they may help us to those habiliments. They may, in fact, serve as ground bait to entice the big Jew journalists and bankers towards our cause. The former will lend us the color, the latter the coin. Anyway, so far as I can see, I mean to give the chosen people a chance. Just a tiny bit of racial stereotyping <laughs> there. <laughs> However, the point I want to make at this stage is it does illustrate the British attitude, the British relationship with their Jewish volunteers and the Jewish their Jewish political counterparts. It was quickly realized in 1915 even that the Entente needed to have the USA on board. It needed the USA's uh, forces, if that was possible, it needed their material, and it needed their funds, the loans that could be raised on Wall Street with which to buy the material. This is where the problem arose, because it was thought that the Jewish population of America were more supportive of Germany rather than the Entente. Up to 1914, the Zionist organization had been headquartered in Berlin. Also, there's a problem, or they thought they saw a problem, of the hundreds of thousands of Russian refugees who had fled the murderous anti-Semitism and the pogroms there. They formed a certain constituency in America, and they were not pro-ally. They were not pro-Russian and they were not pro-Russia's allies either. The best example of this which I've come across is the Jews of Atlanta, Georgia. When the Russo-Japanese War broke out, they started a fund. They wanted to buy the Navy a warship. Whose Navy? They wanted to buy it for the Japanese Navy. <laughs> so there was this perceived uh, perceived ambivalence, pro-Germany perhaps, and they wanted to, do, to demonstrate that the Allied cause was the more noble and the more worthy of support. And they wanted that support to be shown in Washington to encourage the government, and they wanted it to be shown on Wall Street to ease the passage 
of the required loans. <coughs> Confirmation of this crops up later in the transport and supply war diaries when in the late summer there's a proposal to disband the Zion Mule Corps <coughs> and the recorded answer comes back from Imbros not approved. The CNC was strongly in favour of this unit being maintained for political reasons. Training. What should they have learned? They should have learned to look after their mules, to groom, feed, exercise, load and lead their animals, to look after the harness gear and the pack saddles, and last but not least, to look after themselves. We're talking about military discipline and drill for handling those Mauser rifles. Their training was completed on the 16th of April. The next day they were getting on the ship and sailing to Mudros. And here I think we see the root of a lot of the problems which this unit undoubtedly had on Gallipoli. That's just a maximum, a maximum of just three weeks training. It may have been less. In the middle of this you have the very important Jewish festival of Passover that, in 1915, ran from the 28th, evening of the 29th of March until the 6th of April. Also on the 2nd of April, they set up their camp at Wadian, another interruption to the training. So, how much training did they get? Did they get three weeks, such a long time? Was it only two weeks? It doesn't matter, it was not enough. And this aspect is beautifully summed up, I feel, in the Mitchell Report, a resource which should not be neglected. Commodore Mitchell's committee was reported to the Admiralty in October 1919. And if you get through to page 319, 320, something like that, he there defines the quality of the troops employed at landings. He says, the strain on the troops is very great. Therefore, the troops employed should be of the highest quality. Self-sacrifice and gallantry can only be additions to and not substitutes for the essential qualities of training and discipline. You cannot take civilians onto a battlefield and subject them to rifle, machine gun, and shell fire, and expect them to react like battle-hardened veterans. It won't happen. So, moving on to Gallipoli. For the voyage, the Zion Mule Corps was split into two halves. A and B and HQ were on the Hymettus, which you see here, C and G troops were on the Anglo-Egyptian. And at this 11th hour, Colonel Patterson receives orders that his command is to be divided. A and B are going to the 29th Division, and C and D troops are to be attached to Anzacs. C and D troops are mainly locally recruited Alexandrian Jews, not the Russians who'd come out of Palestine. And they're led by Lieutenants McLaren, Carver, and Ibram, <coughs> who, are as, who are as inexperienced as the men they're leading. Patterson protests. His protest is overruled. After all, the two forces are going to meet up in Midos in a couple of days' time. What can possibly go wrong? <laughs> so C and D troop land at Anzac. 
This is Brigadier General Cunliffe Owen, Royal Artillery. And he describes what happened. Unfortunately, they were dressed so like the Turks that everybody shot at them. And they did not stay very long. <laughs> well, I think he may be mistaken about the dress. As far as I know, it was the standard British Army uniform. However, to an anxious digger who's only just landed himself, then the sight of those Mausers must have been very disconcerting. And it could have led to difficulties. It did, in fact, very quickly lead to considerable difficulties. On the 3rd of May, the decision was taken and is recorded in the war diary of the New Zealand and Australia Division. Owing to the difficulty of working with Zion Mule Corps drivers who are unable to speak English and who have had little or no previous training, it has been decided to embark them all. And they're sent back to Alexandria. Patterson hears about this a month later. Uh, Colonel Fred Coe, Acting Brigadier General. He's the Director of Supplies and Transport for the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force and he puts it to Colonel Patterson that there is no alternative but to disband C and D troops. When they got to Alexandria, they were examined by the MO. A lot were unfit, a lot were sick, those who were left behind didn't want to work, some absconded. It was a dreadful situation. Hamilton hears about it even later. He is writing on the 15th of July to Maxwell, and he tells the story this way. You know the Jewish Mule Corps was divided into two portions. The portion at Hellas under Patterson is happy, has done well, and is doing well. The portion at Anzacs did not receive consideration from the Australians, and I fear some of the men were shot or bayoneted under the impression they were Turks, owing to their being unable to reply to challenges. Well, it's impossible to verify Hamilton's statement there. Uh, it could well have happened that men were shot or bayoneted. If we look at the casualties, as we will in a moment, there is at least one case where a gentleman had uh, a name which suggests he was one of the Alexandrian Jews and he dies in an Alexandria hospital in the first half of May. At Hellas, thank you, Steve. At Hellas, the Hymetus has A and B and the headquarters. Alas, the Hymetus is a ground. And I fancy Patterson could have been a bit of a Jonah. The same thing happened to him on the SS Canada as he was leaving Southampton for South Africa. Anyway, 24th, they get transferred, mules and men, to the Dundrenum. She sails for Cape Hellas. And while the 29th Division are making their way from the beaches through St. Elbert, they spend two days offshore watching the horrific fighting. This does nothing for the morale of the <coughs> ZMC. And finally, finally, the piaster drops in the case of those who thought they were going <coughs> to Palestine. This is mainland Turkey. This is not Palestine. Eventually, the Dundrennan is able to discharge them, and they're brought ashore by lighters on the night of the 27th, 28th of April. Major Gillam is in charge in the field of the 29th Divisional Train, and as the Zion Mule Corps are the first transport unit ashore, he is given them to assist in his duties. And he writes, ordered to make a small advance depot just behind the firing line using pack mules under Colonel Patterson of the Zion Mule Corps. 
the drivers are Syrian refugees from Syria and curiously enough speak Russian as their common language. So, the gentleman standing above the arrow is Arthur Felix Berend. Then a second lieutenant. Later he'd write a fantastic book, Make Me a Soldier. And in that he describes what must have been a very typical deployment of the ZMC. I found the Mule Corps in an open meadow. With much saluting, I was taken to the CO, Colonel Patterson, and he handed me over a corporal, six men and 14 mules. Take great care of my men and don't expose them, he said, as he wished me goodbye. The mules don't matter so much as they can be replaced more easily. I returned to our lines, followed by the stolid Zionists and the equally stolid mules, and handed all over to our astonished transport <coughs> sergeant. Half an hour later, I strolled across to see how they were getting on and found they were all sitting around a big fire with our own transport section and a Dixie of tea boiling merrily in the middle. East Lancashire Arabic quickly became the lingua franca <laughs> because our men had picked up a number of Arabic words in Egypt. Equally quickly too, the Zionists won respect and affection because despite their over fondness for saluting, they showed a curious disregard for shell fire. Well, another word for a curious disregard of shell fire must be courage. And not always, but sometimes courage has its reward. Gruskowski, he was wounded by shrapnel in both arms. He nevertheless prevented a stampede and delivered supplies under fire. He was promoted corporal and recommended for the Distinguished Conduct Medal. It's worth remembering at this point that the DCM in those days was for other ranks, second only to the Victoria Cross. Nissel Rosenberg, after the Turks partly broke through the Allied line, he rounded up mules and delivered ammunition under fire. He's promoted sergeant and also recommended for the DCM. Rosenberg, however, receives a mention. Meyer Erschkewitz, he gained both an MID and the Zion Mule Corps Second Distinguished Conduct Medal. Later in the campaign, Claude Rollo, the lieutenant, he gains a mention and also picks up an MC in the 1916 Birthday Honours, which may or may not be related to the Gallipoli campaign. Last but not least, Lieutenant Colonel Patterson, he has another mention to add to those he gained in South Africa. A disregard for shellfire, courage, inevitably there follows casualties. <coughs> this is the list as prepared by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. There are various books which suggest that one or two other people were involved. That has yet to be proved to the satisfaction of the CWGC. Hirsch Stern was killed in action. Abraham Frank killed in action. Frank was married and he had five children and a wife waiting for him in Alexandria. Zoe, he died in hospital in Alexandria. Moscovitz, he was killed during a particularly heavy bombardment. Uh, several men with him were wounded and a dozen mules were killed during that bombardment. Katznelson and Rothman killed in action. Roy died of disease. Bergman killed in action. Halili, we don't know, died of disease or died of wounds. Kurtzner died of wounds. Bardin, he died of either disease or wounds. And Wertheimer, we see Wertheimer's headstone here. That's in the 
Alexandria Jewish Cemetery at Chatby. And last but not least, the second Lieutenant Alexander Gorodisky. He died of disease. Poor soul, he had what today we'd probably describe as pancreatic cancer. So, shell fire, courage, casualties, the strain is beginning to tell. And with the increase in strain, there's also an increase, unfortunately, in the, or a decrease, sorry, a decrease in the discipline of the ZMC. Men are falsely reporting sick or failing to deliver supplies even. Patterson attributes the origins of this to the fact that he sees the men broadly in of two sorts. There are the Russians and the Alexandrians. The Russians, they have self-control and they have zeal for their Zionist cause which gives them a strong will to fight. While the latter exhibit what he describes as a different temperament, unconducive to soldiering. Trumpeldor reluctantly agrees with Patterson. He thinks that the Sephardi Jews were ignorant of the purpose of Zionism and not sufficiently committed to the oath which they had taken. But at the next point, there is a serious falling out between Patterson and his number two, Captain Trumpledore, because under Patterson, the officers of the ZMC take severe, uh, severe measures with their men, up to and including floggings. This, despite flogging having been abolished in the British Army in 1881. Trumpledore was also concerned with the eagerness with which he saw some of the officers, he mentions Claude Rollo, administering this punishment. And he had this serious falling out with Patterson over this issue. This is not necessarily a Jewish problem, it's an Egyptian problem. If we look at Allenby as he went through Gaza and began his advance up through Palestine, he had the same sort of problem with the Egyptian Labour Corps. And in November 1917, he writes to Robertson, the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, and he asks to be excused the prohibition placed by the 1981 Act. Allenby was a great officer, a great general. Patterson took the law into his own hands. He was that sort of officer, I think. Some of the men's complaints were justified. We're talking here about allowances, compensation, widow's pension, and that sort of thing. And to their credit, both Patterson and Maxwell had been raising this subject with the War Office in London. Patterson followed it up personally when he was there in 1916, and the subject was raised again at the Dardanelles Commission in 1917. Unfortunately, no satisfactory outcome came of any of this. An example is the second lieutenant whose death we uh, acknowledged just a few moments ago. He was a professor in Alexandria and he left a widowed mother for whom he was responsible. After something like 24 months, she is given 150 pounds. In his case, that represents less than one year's salary. So, we've had courage, we've had disease, we've had indiscipline. At this point, Hamilton and Patterson agree that a further recruiting drive is needed and Patterson takes his recruiting party himself, Captain Trumpledore, 
Claude Rollo and Corporal Gruszkowski. He takes them to Egypt. Gruszkowski has just received his DCM from the hands of General Stopford. Hunter Weston's been invalided off and Stopford is in Hellas for a week to gain experience. And Patterson and his recruiting party are in Egypt until the end of September. That's two good months. Alas, they enlist only a further 150 recruits, mainly Sephardis, and they are formed into Cairo Troop and serve under their own NCOs. If you've ever been in the army, inspections never happen at the right time, do they? And here we are, 26th of August, Patterson and his number two, Joseph Trumpeldor, they're away in Egypt, and Lieutenant Colonel Oscar Stridinger, Assistant Director of Transport, takes it into his mind to visit Hellas and to carry out an inspection. I'll read some of his report. Mules. Those in regular work in trenches in fair condition. Remainder, poor and neglected due to lack of drivers. Regular daily exercise ordered. 1915, the British Army <coughs> expected its mules to be exercised for a minimum of two hours daily. Personnel. Russian Jews are satisfactory. Most of these are on detachment with regimental units, or RNCOs. Alexandrian Jews are reported by all concerned to be of little use. They make trouble in camp and go sick whenever they're told to do any work. The Corps is certainly not doing much useful work at present. There are about 35 Russians and 60 Alexandrians here, and I understand nearly all of them want to get away. I fancy that feeling was not so uncommon at Hellas at the end of August. Anyway, generally speaking, the mules are dug in and the men also. The lines are dirty and untidy compared with those of other units. Lieutenant Guy. Guy is the lieutenant who has been left in charge while Patterson and Trumbledore are in Cairo. Lieutenant Guy has done his best with the very bad material at his disposal. Well, I'm sure that Oscar Stridinger is not mistaken in his facts. However, there are certain aspects which we should consider. His inspection took place at the base, which must have inevitably been been near W Beach. He did not inspect the men who are with the battalions near the front line. So he didn't actually see the, the keen Russians, excuse me. Also, when he's comparing them with other units, he visited on that day the RND he saw the Indian mule cart train and the 42nd Divisional train. When he's comparing them with other units, it should be borne in mind that these other units all had, to a greater or lesser extent, a degree of leavening of officers and NCOs from the ASC. The Zion Mule Corps had no such benefit. And so we move on to the final months of the campaign. We've heard about Guy. He was in charge while Patterson and Trumpledore were away. On the 9th of November, he decides to transfer to L Battery 15th Brigade Royal Horse Artillery. He's been working closely with them and feels very comfortable <coughs> there. He's made very welcome. Promoted captain. With the 29th and the 29th Division and the 15th Brigade. He is moved to France and Flanders and alas killed on the 28th of February 1917. Moving further on into the final months of the campaign, 
Colonel Patterson, he was evacuated ill on the 25th of November, first to Alexandria and then back to the UK. That puts Captain Joseph Trumpledore in command. And on the 1st of December, the strength of the corps is recorded as five British, two Jewish officers, plus 126 rank and file. There's no number for the mules. On the 19th of December, Trumpledore is wounded and again is on his left side. And the date here is significant, we feel. This is the time of the Suvla and Anzac evacuation and at Hellas, as I think has already been mentioned, there is diversionary tactics going on and these are met by very heavy Turkish shelling, particularly, it's recorded in the diaries, on the Western Mule Trench and on Gully Ravine. Two crucial arteries for supplies going up to the front and it could well be that this was where Trumpledore <coughs> received his wound. However, as with Port Arthur, he remains on duty and oversees the evacuation which takes place at the end of December 1915. And so we come very close to the end. We're in March 1916. There's a parade. Brigadier General Boyle, who is uh, Alexandria's garrison commander, he's joined by consular, civic, and community leaders. The chief rabbi attends. He recites the prayer for the dead. This is, sorry, I beg your pardon. This is at a memorial, at the erection of a memorial in Chatby Cemetery, and we see it here. If this is a 12 foot high marble column standing on a concrete base. There are inscriptions in English, French, and Hebrew. English opposite the French, and then Hebrew on the two other sides. And in each case, the inscription reads, from Zion Mule Corps to Comrades of Honor, 1916. I've had a good look at this photograph. Uh, we only see one face of the base plinth here, but I can spot no inscription. I've asked the Commonwealth War Graves Commission to report back on that. It'll happen next time they have an inspection. Uh, perhaps if the inscription is missing, it's something we can think about doing, perhaps in, cons in cooperation with uh, other organizations such as ourselves, perhaps Ajax. We'll see what the Commonwealth War Graves report comes up with. So Trumpledore is working very hard for the British Army to retain the ZMC, alas, without success. They are offered service in Ireland. However, this they decline. I'm reminded at this point of something which Lawrence said. Damascus is a long way from Jerusalem. No, I beg your pardon. <laughs> the, excuse me. No. Lawrence made a comment, anyway, about the objective being far away from, the proposed objective being far away from the real objective. The real objective in their case was Damascus. Here we have a case where, where Dublin yes, is a long yeah. way from Jerusalem. Sorry about that. That is so, T.E. Lawrence. That is T.E. Lawrence. Correct, sir. So the ZMC is finally disbanded after a little more than a year on the 26th of March, 1916. What sort of recognition did they get? Well, we know that Hamilton was anxious to keep his public relations in good order, especially in America. So he writes 
to the journalist Jabotinsky, whom we came across earlier. The men have done extremely well, working their mules calmly under heavy shell and rifle fire, and thus showing a more difficult type of bravery than the men in the front line who had the excitement of combat to keep them going. Hamilton puts it more succinctly when he is writing to General Maxwell. What would we have done without the Zion Mule Corps, I do not know. Let's hear from a chap at the sharp end. Major Muir, 5th Battalion, the Royal Scots. He is writing in his book with the incomparable 29th. And here he refers to the Zion Muleteer's habit of returning from the front line with wounded men riding on their animals. And he sums it up admirably. They did excellent and merciful work all through the campaign. Now, my stumble a few moments ago probably suggests I should be retaking my seat at the table. I'm going to leave the last word to a founder member of this association, Major John Ford. On one occasion on which I went to Baghdad, I got into my compartment and there sat opposite me uh, a gentleman who was in a rather disreputable raincoat uh, and said good evening to me in what I took to be broken English. I said good evening to him and uh, after a while I put down on the, the, bed, the seat bench my blanket and the sheet, which was all, all I needed to lie down uh, in, in preparation of uh, uh, sleeping. When he said to me, uh, are you going to, to, to lie down? I said, yes. When he gets out of the compartment and after about five minutes comes back with a, an Indian soldier carrying his bedroll. The Indian soldier put his, be put his bedroll down on the other bench on the other side and then uh, the uh, this uh, officer took off his uh, Mac and I discovered he was a lieutenant colonel in the RMC. It surprised me. So I said to him, I see we're in the same corps. He said, yes, also in broken English. And he was also wearing the first three men, the first the three men on ribbons of the First World War. I see we're in the First World War too. He said, yes. He said, but not in the RMC. I said, who were you with? He said, with the RESC, water transport. And then, oh, and I said, where, where, was, uh, where were you then? He said, at uh, Gripoli. Then, then it dawned on me who he was. So I said to him, uh, were you in the Zion Mill Corps? He said, yes. I said, did you go up uh, to um, Mudros in a boat called the Hymetus from Alexandria? He said, yes. We were both on the same boat going up to Gallipoli together. In the, in the, so we met in both World's War and both travelling together in the in the train this time, not a boat. That's fascinating, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. I discovered that afterwards. He was the malaria ma malariologist for the whole of the Pie Force. Was a, a quite a famous man, and he he told me he'd been up in in Persia collecting mosquitoes. He'd come back with a whole collection of them to, for, you know, to look to go for his researches. What was his name? Can you remember? No, I'm not. I didn't know. He didn't tell me his name at the time, and uh, or, uh, I did mention the, the incident to one of my own officers when I went back. And but I, won't, I, I, I don't think he, either he knew his name either. But uh, the army records no doubt could tell you. <laughs> That's a very interesting story to round off your record. And <laughs> thank you very much, Major Ford. Thank you. I'd have liked to have met Major Ford. I'd have liked to have given him the finish to his story, to answer his question. Thank you, Steve. This is the gentleman who shared his compartment in Iraq in 43. You see him here 
around about 1918, 1919. He, in 1915, was second lieutenant Geronim Mayer. In 1943, he was Lieutenant Colonel Gideon Mayer. And as Major Ford described, he was a malariologist. After he left Major Ford, he was posted out to the Far East. He became OC Number 1 Malaria Field Laboratory, SEAC. And in 1945, he was awarded the OBE. And the citation refers to his unflagging zeal, determination, and scientific achievements, which have been of very <coughs> material value to the Army. Professor Gidon Mayer, a great man. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention.